Hello and welcome to Best of the Day. I'm Dr. Christy Russell from the University of Southern California and I'm at the 2013 San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. While I'm here, I'm going to do four different sets of interviews uh, for some of the best breast cancer experts that have come to the meeting. And I've broken it into four different groups of interviews. Uh, one will be based on HER2 positive, uh, one will be based on surgical questions, and that will be this interview uh, that we're going to have now. There'll be another one on hormone therapy, and then one on unique aspects of chemotherapy um, for patients with breast cancer. So I'll begin with um, the session uh, today, and that's with Dr. Steven Sainer. And uh, Steve is professor of surgery at the University of Southern California, and he's the director of our breast cancer surgical program um, and chair of surgical oncology at USC. So thank you for joining me, Steve. I appreciate it. Pleasure. We're going to talk about four different abstracts that were presented today at San Antonio around the issues of local recurrence, local care, um, and topics I think are, are interesting um, and I believe have meaning for medical oncologists out there who are trying to m help make decisions about uh, care for their patients with breast cancer. So the first one I'd like to talk to is um, a trial that I didn't know was going on, which was called the PRIME2 trial. And um, it was presented by Dr. Kunkler, but it's a group from um, the uh, from the United Kingdom uh, doing this trial. So can you walk me through the trial and, and then give me some of the results of the trial? Right, so Mike Dixon's the organizer of the trial, so based primarily in Scotland. And this is a randomized trial to evaluate uh, the use of radiation therapy in older women. So it, it was a trial that uh, took patients and then they had lumpectomy, they had for ER positive disease, they all got uh, adjuvant hormone therapy, and then the randomization was to radiation, no radiation. And uh, interestingly enough, the, the, the evaluation of the data was presented as five-year median survival, so it's sort of short-term information, uh, but it's interesting. Um, uh, the, the patients who had an ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence uh, with radiation, there was only, it was 1.3 percent, and those who did not have radiation, it was 4 percent, and that was statistically significant, but uh, the authors properly note that they're not quite sure whether that's a clinically significant difference, and the way they couched that in the presentation was to say that a 4 percent uh, risk of local recurrence at five years Maybe you may be able to justify the omission of radiation for that relatively small risk of low recurrence, uh, local recurrence. Nevertheless, a statistically significant difference between the two groups, uh, but but no other survival differences, disease-free survival, uh, overall survival, the same between the two cohorts. So, on their multivariate analysis, the only two risk factors that fell out as meaningful were whether the radiation was given or not. And the other was a sort of an intriguing subset of patients who had low quantitative ER, they called it low ER, uh, as opposed to high ER. Uh, <clears throat> low ER w uh, predicted for local recurrence uh, more so than high ER. So uh, that, that's an interesting subset that we could perhaps talk about. And, but uh, what we find interesting uh, about this is there is another trial that was presented this year by Kevin Hughes, which looks at the subset of women who are older, older than 70. The current uh, PRIME2 trial was for women over 65 years of age, so there's a bit of a difference between the two trials. But if you look at Kevin Hughes' data, which is now 10-year data published this year in JCO, <clears throat> again, there was a modest difference between the radiation and no radiation arms. Uh, and indeed, at 10 years in the Hughes trial, uh, the relapse-free, local relapse-free uh, rate was 90 percent. And those authors make the same statement that perhaps it's okay to omit radiation in, in this group of patients, despite the fact that there's a, a significant difference. So the difference in both these studies, however, is a local recurrence or an ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence. 
And if you have an older patient <laughs> that you're not going to give chemotherapy to, because neither one of these trials, to my memory, includes chemotherapy. Everybody's just getting a hormone therapy. Right, that's right. Um, you know, if you have an ipsilateral recurrence, you can always do a lumpectomy again at that time and radiate, or you could always do a mastectomy. Um, I think it's hard to grasp, really, in my mind, who to eliminate radiation. Right. So from a technical point of view, even in these two trials, the, the, the subsets are statistically different between radiation and no radiation, but the, but the re local recurrence risks are so low mm -hmm. that it, it still begs the question. <clears throat> And we're looking at favorable patients here. We're looking at T1 tumors. Uh, in the tr current PRIME2 trial, they accepted T tumors up to three centimeters. They're all ER positive. So it's a favorable subset to begin with. So the, from my point of view, the local recurrence risks, the absolute risk of local recurrence in both of these trials is pretty low, mm -hmm. and you'd expect it to be. So, and you're right, you sure, you still have options, don't you, if you have somebody who has a, a local recurrence. And the, I think the other point, again, is that both trials are showing no difference in distant metastases, no difference in overall survival. And in fact, when you start to accrue patients into these kind of trials that are older, you start to have a lot of competitive reasons for death. Um, yes. And I would think you'd never see a survival advantage to the radiation. Well, well that's what uh, Kunkler and Dixon showed us in this trial that, that uh, the competing mortality risks, uh, the majority of those patients died from other causes of, of those who died during this trial. So. so I think we have a second trial now for people who are trying to make a decision whether to refer their patients for radiation therapy or not, and they're, they're supportive of one another. I think that it helps that the Hughes trial was published this year, and it I believe it helps for the longer follow-up in ER positive to know that you are going to continue to have events over time. And five years of follow-up on an ER positive trial is really short. Right. I think we both know that the relapses of those who are destined to recur with ER positive disease, a substantial number of them recur between years five and ten. Right. So, right. Perfect. Okay, so then the next two abstracts are getting at a point which um, we've been trying to run trials in this country around the topic of women who present with metastatic breast cancer, so not who develop metastases later, but present with stage four breast cancer, and you're trying to figure out what to do with the primary in the breast. Um, and so I'm gonna have you walk through both of these trials, but they were um, given, uh, presented sequentially to one another, and then uh, Seema Khan, from Northwestern University did a, a commentary on it. So the first one um, was from uh, Tata Memorial in India, um, and it was um, removal of the primary uh, tumor and axillary lymph nodes and radiation therapy uh, versus not in patients presenting with metastatic cancer. So why don't you walk us through that data? Right. So. This was an interesting trial, wasn't it? They, they screened 440 women who presented uh, with stage 4 disease. And uh, in fact, what they did was to give systemic treatment up front. So they gave six cycles of anthracycline-based chemotherapy. And of those who responded then, they decided to randomize those between local regional therapy and no local regional therapy. So interestingly, we already have some selection bias inherent here. People who progressed or had stable disease were not offered local therapy. So of the 440 that they screened, 350 were, were then randomized. So, uh, so that's sort of what you'd expect, I think, if you look at the cohorts. And then of the 177 who are localized, to, uh, who are randomized to no local regional therapy, 10% of them actually wound up having local regional therapy for palliative purposes. So that also fits sort of what we might think as the, what, what the mix should look like. So they wound up uh, offering 173 patients local treatment and 177 didn't get it. And, and then everybody got hormone therapy, which was initiated after 
the surgery. So uh, I found that a, a bit interesting that the hormone therapy was delayed until well after, well down the road, after the chemotherapy, after the selection process. Uh, so, but anyway, they, they did get hormone therapy eventually. And <clears throat> interestingly enough, the overall survival was virtually the same between the two arms. It was about 18 months. Uh, and the, um, so the local regional treatment had no impact on overall survival. Um, so theoretically, the reason why this was done is because there's been a lot of retrospective studies that have suggested a, a survival advantage by removing the breast primary in patients with metastatic cancer, that presumably the thinking was that this was a source of continued metastases for their patients or something. But um, as Dr. Badway explained, who did the presentation, he brought up um, Bernie Fisher's original observation from decades ago that when you remove a primary in a patient with metastases, the metastases will grow faster. And so that you had the risk that by removing the primary, actually the outcome for the patients could have been a lot worse. So there's a nugget in this trial that sort of refers to that, and it's that the, the, the distant relapse-free survival was worse in those who had local regional treatment despite good local control rates. So um, I wasn't sure how to put that into the context of the Fisher analysis because part of that was animal studies and uh, sort, of, we sort of got lost in translation. But uh, <clears throat> the, I think this trial starts, it was a well done trial actually. Mm -hmm. they, and they started to try to do some um, uh, subset analysis, but they resisted that. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, about 28% of the patients had bone-only metastasis, so uh, <clears throat> we still think there might be some selection bias in these trials. Nevertheless, there, there's, it was pretty clear there's no difference in survival here. Right, so it doesn't appear that there was necessarily harm, except for maybe some subgroups, and no real benefit other than giving the patient local control, but no overall survival and no hint of overall survival advantage by removing the primary. And not just removing the primary, axillary lymph node dissection and in-field radiation therapy. I mean, they really yes. sterilized the primary area. Right. They treated these patients as though they were not stage four at presentation. Right. They gave right. them what we would give for stage one or two disease. Right. So interesting study. I'm, I didn't know what was going on. It was, it was wonderful to see that someone had actually pulled it off in a randomized fashion because we've been trying in this country to do this study for quite some time and have not been successful. Right. Exactly. So the, the second trial, sort of right on the back end of that, was a Turkish study. Um, and it was a randomized trial evaluating the resection of the primary tumor in women presenting with de novo stage 4 breast cancer. So Talk to me about the differences between those studies and what their outcomes were. So this was a little bit different in, the, in that the, uh, the local regional therapy was up front and the systemic treatment came after local regional uh, treatment. Um, and in this group, uh, they had, there were patients got trastuzumab for her two positive disease. About 30% of them were her, posit her two positive. Uh, so they got the same kind of local regional therapy that was given in the TATA trial where they, they had lumpectomy, they had regional radiation, uh, uh, so, uh, and they had axillary dissection just like the previous trial. They just switched the batting order. Uh, the systemic treatment came later. And you got a sense that the, the, the systemic therapy was a little bit more like we would use in the United States. They had better access to drugs. The TATA trial, they were, did, no one got Herceptin. I'm not even sure they could test for HER2 um, through that study. So this was a little bit more modern chemotherapy. Um, and it was just given the appropriate chemotherapy for metastatic cancer after the local therapy randomization. Right. Uh, the mean follow-up was relatively short. It was only 21 months. but. Uh, the overall survival, once again, no different. It was around the 30 to 35 percent range at 20 months. So um, 
uh, again, uh, no, no difference in survival here. And yet uh, these authors did not resist the chance to do subset analysis. And um, uh, interestingly enough, uh, when they, they started to look at the bone-only subset, and even further than that, solitary bone metastasis, and the point was made in the discussion from the floor after the presentation that only half of these patients had their solitary bone metastasis biopsy. Right. So that's a bit of an issue here, but um, they tried to uh, make us believe that solitary bone metastasis, uh, there might be a difference in survival between those two groups, but uh, it's a tough sell, I think. This was an unplanned subset analysis in which only half the patients got the biopsy that we all would have wanted to confirm right. the metastatic process. Yeah, but you can see that in practice that patients, you know, with a, a primary in place and just with a, a single bone metastasis and thinking that you might be able to control that with a, a radiation therapy and systemic therapy, that it'd be nice to get rid of the primary lesion. I, I think the problem with the way they presented it is we don't even know if those were metastases or not. The presumption is that they could figure out whether they were or not, but um, those are the kind of patients when we really think heavily about what, you know, whether we should get rid of the primary so it's not a local control problem eventually. I'm not sure I'd use this study to prove that that's the right decision. No, and are we going to biopsy everybody with a solitary finding that's consistent with a bone mat? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we try to at this point. I think the standard of care really is um, in the United States that that is what we should be doing. Prove that they're stage four mm -hmm. um, so that you're not making all of your systemic decisions and local decisions based on wrong information. Not, not all are accessible, but I, I think it's certainly worth doing. And, um, and, and I think the groundswell from the floor and the commentary was that um, you're kidding yourself if you don't biopsy these and then put them into a trial presuming they have stage four disease. So what's, what's interesting to me about both of these trials is that uh, with all of the debate in this country about selection bias and you know what, what really are we looking at here, uh, um, here are two trials that say virtually the same thing about survival. Mm -hmm. uh, that were really pretty well done, actually. They had to be done offshore for us, but uh, there are some hints here about what's actually happening. I agree, and it you know it begs the question whether we should continue down that path in terms of a clinical trial in this country. Do, you know what what will we learn other than do these metastases represent some different genomic clone? Um, you know, is it important to look at the difference between the primary and the metastases? I mean. To me, from these two trials, I can't imagine we're ever going to see a trial where there's a survival benefit. And so you got to go after different endpoints, I would think, if you're going to continue down that vein of doing this trial. Right. And, and to wit, the ECOG 2108 is not accruing very well, which is our version of this trial, right. uh, as Seema Khan pointed out in her discussion. So uh, I think the authors are to be congratulated that they were able to get the studies done. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And, and I think that done so well with good randomization that uh, we don't need to say that we need to repeat that trial here in this country. Agree. The, the last trial was presented by the NSABP <coughs> and Tom Julian, and it was um, a long-term follow-up on NSABP B32. Um, and that was a randomized phase three clinical trial comparing Sentinel lymph node resection to um, conventional axillary lymph node dissection uh, after a negative sentinel lymph node. And, and we've seen a lot of preliminary uh, data on this, and, and they were looking to give us long-term outcomes from these patients. Right. So uh, B32 was an interesting trial. Uh, accrued well and was done at the, exactly the right time. So it, it basically took sentinel node negative patients and randomized them between sentinel node only and a completion axillary dissection. And so what they've done now is to go back and look at the sentinel node negative patients in this trial <clears throat> and look, if, look for occult metastases. 
and help us decide or f figure out whether occult metastases have any bearing on, on the outcome in these patients. So originally there were f like 5,600 patients in B32, and they went back and did an analysis of 3,800 of those patients uh, looking uh, for occult metastases using IHC. So to me, this is a, a great trial that will put the rest IHC forever in sentinel node evaluation. So when they did that, they actually found for these patients who are H&E negative, uh, 3,800, half in the sentinel node only arm and half in the sentinel node plus axillary dissection arm, 15% of each of those two arms had occult metastasis. That's a little higher than others have shown in the past. It's usually around 10%, but it, that's fine. Uh, so 15% of these patients in both arms had occult metastasis. And so this was a secondary endpoint analysis with 10-year evaluation. So it's a long-term study. And it, it, it's really pretty interesting because th uh, there was no survival advantage between the two arms. Overall survival, disease-free survival, distant disease-free survival, they were all dead heat. As you would have expected. Of I course. mean, you would have expected that an axillary lymph node dissection after a negative sentinel lymph node would not have added anything. Um, but then the question comes, you know, if there are enough occult uh, metastases in lymph nodes here, um, do you have left behind tumor that you would have axillary recurrences in some patients? Right, so the interesting group are the 300 patients who had a sentinel node only who wound up having a cult metastasis. What happened to them? The axillary recurrence rate was 0.5 percent. There's just no, no, there was no added value to the axillary dissection on top of a sentinel node biopsy when the metastasis were detected by IHC. And the study didn't control for systemic therapy afterwards, although it was an NSABP study, so people were getting standard of care for systemic therapy for node-negative uh, breast cancer right. afterwards. Right. So the two points they made, the two conclusions are axillary dissection is not necessary for occult metastatic disease, and IHC is no longer recommended for the evaluation of sentinel lymph nodes. I think we've hopefully put that question to rest for our pathology colleagues. And as you know, when you get information, because there's still plenty of institutions that are doing IHC on negative lymph nodes, especially the sentinel lymph node, um, people are acting on that information. And I think it gives us further confirmation that the outcome of those patients in this study for 10 years of follow-up was very, very good in terms of local recurrence, systemic recurrence, um, and it, it, hopefully institutions who are making the decisions to do IHC can abandon it. Yes. I think it's very telling that for those who had IHC positive sentinel nodes who got standard conventional therapy for node negative disease, the, the, the regional recurrence risk is less than 1%. Mm -hmm. I think we're done with this question. Right. So fantastic, thank you. So I hope that you are uh, able to enjoy the surgical aspects from the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. I, I think the highlights are, at, at least at this point, for stage four disease, um, we can't find a reason to do um, a mastectomy uh, for the purposes of improving survival and um, the issues around um, uh, occult metastasis and uh, IHC testing of sentinel lymph nodes, I think, has been put to bed as well. So I appreciate your joining us for the highlights of the surgical aspects of the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, and uh, thank you very much for speaking with me. Please listen to the other three um, interviews that I'm doing on the aspects of HER2-positive breast cancer and hormone receptor positive breast cancer and aspects of chemotherapy uh, for especially for those who are triple negative and thank you for joining me as well.